So welcome everyone to this conference. Um, so as you know, this session is DPRK relations and area studies. Um, my name is Andrew Miller. I'll be the chair. Um, so um, as I was saying, we have four speakers this morning, um, potentially. So we have Eugene Lee, then myself, then next to me, uh, Mr. Jia, and finally, Arushi Singh. Um, as of right now, um, Eugene Lee and Arushi are not here, so we just have the two presentations. Um, hopefully, Eugene and Arushi will join us a bit later. So, so um, I guess I will be the first presenting, unless I you want to go first. Okay, so. Okay, so um, good morning once again. So uh, my name is Andrew Miller. Um, I am an assistant professor down in Changwon. So um, I've actually been in Korea now for almost 17 years, um, pretty much mostly in Busan. Um, these days, as well as working at Changwon University, I also represent the European Chamber of Commerce in Korea um, as the Busan representative. Um, so most of my focus is actually on Europe, um, but when I received the email about this conference, I thought it'd be interesting to uh, see what the um, policy with is North Korea. So um, today I'm going to focus on the EU and the DPRK. So why the EU needs to return to this idea of having a country specific paper for North Korea. So I'll skip the um, contents. So um, just a quick introduction. So um, as you all know, I hope the European Union um, has been a great success in terms of regional integration. We've gone from this small group of six Western European states forming just a coal and steel community, developing over the past 70 years to this now deeply integrated European Union in economic integration, political integration, and now also social integration. So we have the single market with a single currency. It was the Nobel Peace Prize winner back in 2012. So um, the EU has all of this European success. However, in terms of its influence on the global stage, it's much weaker. So um, they have been developing the CFSP, which is the common foreign and security policy um, to push for a more cohesive foreign policy amongst the member states. Um, in particular, over the past sort of six, seven years, post sort of Lisbon Treaty, quite a few different reforms regarding cohesion and things like that. 2016, they had the global strategy when they sort of focused um, more that was sort of the update of the 2003 security strategy. And then more recently, just in 2021, um, with regards to Asia, they signed the strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, which shows that they are starting to focus um, a bit more on the um, Asian region. So what is the uh, necessity? So um, I read a lot of Korean papers and they all have this idea of a P or something. So uh, this paper focuses on the relations between the European Union and North Korea. Um, I'll skip this part here. Um, so basically I'm going to propose a new country specific paper. Why? Because if the EU does want to become a global actor, if it does want to become this superpower that sort of rivals, not necessarily rivals, but equals or has the same influence as, say, the United States or China, then it has to start being much more active in foreign policy in different regions around the world. Um, and it needs to start doing this arguably on a slightly more unilateral basis, which you may disagree with because um, for those who study the EU, um, the EU likes to do everything on a multilateral basis. However, um, as we'll see through this paper, the EU tends just to follow what everyone else does. It doesn't really have its own specific policies, and that is, in my opinion, making it much less influential. So uh, we'll start by looking at sort of the early relations in the 1990s. Um, so 
after the end of the Cold War and sort of mid 1990s, this is when the European Union really started to turn its attention in general to Asia. And of course, this includes North Korea. So for especially Southeast Asia, but really Northeast Asia was the target. We have obviously Korea, Japan, China, huge markets, sustainable development, so economic development. However, of course, if you want this sustainable economic development, you also therefore have to have stability in the region and North Korea was providing more instability. So this is one of the reasons why the EU started to focus on North Korea to try to just create more stability in the peninsula and therefore again, create more economic and development. So they um, started with some simple dialogue and started to build some trust. Um, so we have these two periods, um, 1995 to 2002, which Bondas describes as active engagement, um, and then 95 to 2003, which Alexandrova describes as unconditional engagement. So for me, this is really the key part, this word here, unconditional. Um, that's something I'm going to come back to later on. So um, what we should also mention um, at this point in the sort of mid to late 90s, the DPRK was also actively engaging outside as well. So we have the 1994 agreed framework. Um, we also have relations improving with South Korea. So we're in the Kim dae -jung library today. So the sunshine policy from Kim dae -jung. So it did look like North Korea at that point was very much open, or sorry, willing to open up and therefore work more closely with these foreign powers. So that was also important. Um, because all of this active engagement, unconditional engagement was taking place, um, we can see there were some positive effects. EP, uh, sorry, EU DPRK, oh, sorry, I'm speaking too fast. EU DPRK trade did increase. So from 1993 to 2002, generally there was positive trade growth. So in 1996, for example, was about $276 million worth of trade. By 1998, just two years later, $350 million. So you do see this increase in trade between the two regions, um, covering quite a, a large variety of goods. So agricultural products, cars, textiles, salt, uh, machinery, and so on. So what we see in the 90s, as we see this dialogue, as we see um, trust slowly being built, you see these positive effects. Um, then we have in 1997, um, the EU became a member of Kido. So Kido had started two years earlier. Um, so the EU did join slightly late. And when it did join, it was mostly as a financial contributor, to be honest. Um, so during its time, it contributed roughly $120 million, which is over a period of five to six years. Um, also important during this time, the EU was a strong supporter of maintaining this project to provide North Korea with these two light water reactors. Now, this was even when there were suspicions by the US that, oh, maybe these even light water reactors could be later on changed or developed. I don't know the science behind this, please don't ask me. But the uh, US did sort of think, oh, maybe we shouldn't be supplying these two new reactors. But even then, the EU was pretty clear, no, this is the right path to go on, so let's continue down this path. Also, Japan never really supported the EU's role in Kido. But again, the EU was very committed to doing this. So what we see here is the EU not really focusing too much on what the US wants or what the other regional powers want in Asia, but the EU had more of its own specific plan and continued on with that policy. Um, with regards to di diplomatic relations, um, they started, well, not officially, but since 1998, there were delegations going between Pyongyang and Brussels. So the European Parliament sent a delegation to Pyongyang, and then Pyongyang also sent delegations to Brussels. So we see these again sort of 
political interactions starting to happen. Um, Italy officially started relations with the DPRK in 2000, and then just one year later, 2001, this is when the EU officially started diplomatic relations. So um, this is important because the EU continued to pursue these relations, even when other states were starting to turn away from the DPRK. So by this point, very late 90s, early 2000s, again, this is when there was a lot of suspicion about the DPRK continuing on with its nuclear program, despite the agreed framework. But even the EU was like, no, 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 we've made all of this progress, let's keep pushing. Okay. So in 2001, they signed the country-specific paper, uh, which had three main aims. So this is from the, uh, if you read the paper that I wrote, um, all of the um, sources are in the paper. Um, institutional support and capacity building, which was to strengthen key institutions for economic development, reduce poverty, and open up the DPRK to the international community. Sustainable management of natural resources, which was to support, again, economic growth and development, and of course, also improving the transportation sector. Um, in addition, from 2003 to 2006, um, they set aside 35 million euros for technical assistance to North Korea. But again, um, even those 35 million euros is maybe a small amount. Again, we see the timeline 2003 to 2006. So still, the EU was still committed to providing assistance to North Korea. It had this very clear, arguably functional approach um, based on this sort of slowly developing economic relations, the slowly developing trust and diplomatic relations. Let's continue with this path. Um, however, um, as we know, um, the issue of nuclear weapons in North Korea then really took over, started to dominate um, all relations. So the six party talks started in 2003. Now the EU wanted to have a role in those six party talks. Um, however, they decided that they would not actively push or force themselves into having a role. On the other hand, if they were invited to the talks, then they were going to accept those invitations and take part. In the end, um, they were not invited. So effectively, the EU had at this point two options. They could either follow the rest of the Western world and condemn North Korea for continuing with its nuclear weapons program and apply sanctions through the UN and so unilateral sanctions, or it could have continued with its policy, like Alexandra said, of unconditional engagement. However, um, as we know, the EU basically chose to follow the other powers, and this led to abrupt disengagement. Okay. So 2006, we have the first nuclear weapons test. Um, EU followed UN sanctions, uh, applied its own unilateral sanctions. Uh, I don't go into any detail about that, but just so we know that. Um, however, the one area where it has maintained relations with North Korea is through humanitarian assistance. So since 1995, um, the EU says it's um, supplied North Korea with 136 million euros. Um, in assistance in over 130 projects focusing on food assistance, healthcare provision, um, provision of clean drinking water, and so on. Um, so, is this funding enough? Arguably, this is very insignificant funding amounts. Over here, we're talking 27 years now, 28 years, 136 million dollars uh, euros. This is really not a huge amount of assistance in terms of financial aid. However, uh, much more important than the monetary value is we still see this, even if it's a slight one, connection between the EU and North Korea, maintaining some sort of 
relation. Could you say that is trust building? Um, that's much more debatable, but at least there is that lifeline. So um, since the country specific paper expired in 2004, um, the EU has basically followed a policy of critical engagement. Um, Bondas describes this as a partial failure. Um, I would describe this as a complete failure because um, the DPRK, it has remained pretty much fully isolated. You could argue relations with China and so on, and maybe Russia, but generally the global um, picture, it has remained isolated. It's continued its nuclear weapons program. Um, this is not in the paper, but I was reading, I think it was yesterday or the day before. Um, there are now a lot of people who think that North Korea's nuclear program is now surpassing that of the US in terms of its research and development rate. So North Korea, it's not showing any signs of even slowing down, but obviously it's even ramping up, it's accelerating. Um, this all comes despite all of the sanctions put against it for the past however many years. Um, the humanitarian situation um, has not improved. You could argue it's probably worsened. Um, the DPRK and the EU no longer have much trust with each other because the EU has followed what the rest of the world wants. And certain projects like the EU DPRK Trade Capacity Project came to an end. Again, this was doing quite well in 2007. 20 North Korean companies networking with small and medium enterprises in Europe. So again, slowly they were building these networks, these trading networks and so on, but those have all um, disappeared. So if we look at just the basic um, trading statistics, you can see here, um, end of the 1990s, early 2000s, when we have this country specific paper, when they have this sort of almost decade of developing dialogue, trust building between them. We see trade growth between them, sort of capping off here around 300 million according to trading economics. But as soon as the um, country specific paper expires and the EU then follows um, disengagement or critical engagement, we can see it has been dropping off ever since. Down 2019, obviously you could argue COVID has some effect in 2020, 21, but it's pretty much negligible trading over the past few years. So based on that, we definitely need um, to return to a, a new policy towards the North Koreans. Um, in this section, I'll just skip over this quickly. Um, this just shows that the EU is looking at Asia, including Southeast Asia, um, much more positively these days, so they recognize that Asia um, is much more important. In the past, um, Northeast Asia alone was only important, but now they recognize the whole um, region. Um, and so through these different agreements, so the EU ASEAN Strategic Partnership, and through the strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, you have all of these new policies, which are region-wide, which they're sort of macro policies, but if they go through with these, then the EU is going to be um, investing a lot of resources into the region. There's no reason why some of these resources could not be shifted towards North Korea. Um, in terms of diplomatic relations, um, currently there are no official diplomatic relations between the EU and DPRK. Relations are only maintained through member state embassies. Um, as of 2018, there were seven which had embassies, which included the UK. Um, maybe you know, maybe you don't, I don't know. Um, the UK has left the European Union. Maybe that passed through, no one really saw that. Um, okay, so proposal for a new CSP, so country specific paper. Um, so according to the European External Action Service, CVID is needed to reduce tensions on the peninsula, strengthen non-proliferation and improve human rights. So specifically, the European Union, again, is still following this global idea, we must denuclearize North Korea. 
Once we do that, we can improve human rights and so on and so forth. However, as we just saw before, none of this has happened. So in my opinion, uh, this is maybe a little bit more controversial. Um, the nuclear weapons issue needs to be dealt with separately. So a new country specific paper should return to the previous policy of the late 90s, early 2000s of unconditional engagement. So um, first point I suggest a strategy that accepts, so this is the controversial one, the DPRK as a nuclear weapon state and therefore reintroduces the previous approach of unconditional engagement. So here we have to face up to the fact North Korea, I'm almost done. North Korea, after 70 years of developing these nuclear weapons, building its entire military around them, its security, it is not going to denuclearize. After 30 years of constant, um, very severe sanctions, it will not denuclearize. So maybe it's time that we just accept it and say, if we can develop this sort of environment where they don't feel they have to use these nuclear weapons, even if they had them, then we can sort of create a much better, a much safer, more stable system. We can bring North Korea in. So second point, the role of the EU would be an objective actor pursuing economic security in the region by developing trade relations with the DPRK. So as we saw earlier, this is possible. Trade can be um, quite um, beneficial, positive some. This would follow a functional approach. So we all know the EU was built on functionality, um, building these functional processes, um, providing aid, technical assistance, initially in areas that require it most. So a return to the carrot approach, incentivizing the DPRK to open up in return for more progressive trade and investment agreements, okay, just as the EU has done on its own neighborhood policy in Europe. Um, five, provide, again, going back to the previous country paper, institutional, technical, and financial assistance in the long term, in particular institutional. Um, and also, in order to do this, they will need a plan to push for sanctions reductions in the UN. Um, of course, this is not going to be easy. There are going to be challenges. So does the EU have the will to take on this unilateral approach? Um, right now, uh, unfortunately, I would say it doesn't. But in my opinion, it needs to if it wants to develop itself as a, a global power. Um, the sanctions issue, um, how is it going to overcome those? Um, it's going to face a lot of objection from, in particular, the US. Um, like I said, we need to separate this nuclear issue from aid and trade and so on. Oh, oh yes, that makes sense. Um, also, what is the DPRK's will? Does the DPRK also want to go through with this or are they happy as they are? So there are quite a few challenges, but um, as we've seen past 20 years, nothing has improved. Maybe it's time for a change of something. Okay, so um, I'll finish there. Um, like I said, um, we'll go through all the presentations and then we'll have discussions later. So um, I think next up is Oliver. Oliver, so, thank you for that presentation. Very informative. So um, yes, uh, my name is Oliver Jeff. I'm a PhD student at Ritz Mekong University in Kyoto in international relations. And my specialty is Japan North Korea relations. So I completed my master's at Ritz Mekong. Uh, I looked at uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's uh, policy on North Korea. And uh, currently, I'm doing my research comparing Japan and South Korea's foreign policy on North Korea. Uh, but the presentation for today, it's uh, more of a general overview on the last 20 years of Japan North Korea relations. Specifically, uh, with regards to the Pyongyang Declaration, which was a, an agreement signed by both countries in 2002. So Japan and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea were expected to start a new age of relations on September 17, 2002. 
After 10 decades of Tokyo's on again, off again attempts at brokering normalization with Pyongyang, both sides finally reached the point of a leader level summit in the DPRK's capital. But the mood was far from positive between Japanese Prime Minister Koizumi Jimichiro and North Korean Supreme Leader Kim Jong il. Japan for years had pressured North Korea to come clean on its abductions of Japanese citizens, which the North Korean regime had done clandestinely throughout the 1970s and 80s for the purposes of spycraft. Koizumi and Kim signed what was called the Pyongyang Declaration, an official document that was supposed to be the basis for Japan-North Korea relations. Yet, in the two decades since, both sides remain hostile towards one another without any indication that the status quo will change. Japan maintains that the abductions are unresolved, while North Korea has tested multiple nuclear weapons and continues to isolate itself from the rest of the world. So the paper that I wrote explores the legacy of Japan and DPRK relations in the last two decades, while specifically focusing on the question of if the Pyongyang Declaration is still relevant today. The main thesis argues that though well-intentioned, the Pyongyang Declaration was ultimately a very flawed document from the outset, and that North Korea's subsequent behavior illustrates that it never intended to abide by its principles. The two-part structure of the paper analyzes the four main points of the Pyongyang Declaration and compares it to other agreements made by North Korea, specifically the 1994 Agreed Framework, the 2000 South North Declaration, and the 2018 Singapore Declaration. And the goal of this is to illustrate that the Pyongyang Declaration shares many similar problems with other agreements that the US and South Korea have made with North Korea, and that the circumstances around diplomacy follow these similar patterns. So we begin with an analysis of the Pyongyang Declaration itself. The Pyongyang Declaration consists of four main points which were intended to provide a basis for the normalization of Japan DPRK relations through the settlement of unfortunate past between them and outstanding issues of concern. Though a relatively short document, the points included cover a surprising range of issues which would have been relevant for both sides at the turn of the century. However, my main criticism is that I think the language utilizes leaves room for widely different interpretations on both sides and appears to sidestep explicit mention of more sensitive topics in favor of more neutral wording while also being limited by a lack of goodwill on both sides. I provide examples of North Korea's violations of the Pyongyang Declaration's points, which further illustrate its lack of binding nature to the present day. But interestingly enough, both sides actually do call back to the Pyongyang Declaration uh, which assumes that there is still some kind of legitimacy, but that remains to be seen. So the first section of the Pyongyang Declaration emphasizes early normalization of the relations and solving outstanding problems based on mutual trust um, as its main themes. But from the outside, there appears to be the presumption that normalization of relations is close at hand, given that future talks are explicitly set for the following month, and that early normalization of relations is being stressed. More notable, however, is the inclusion of the phrase outstanding problems tied to the other phrase mutual trust. This suggests that both sides are entering these discussions based largely on goodwill, yet the previous years of exhaustive negotiations before the 2002 Pyongyang summit paints an entirely different picture. The road to a leader level summit had not been an easy one. Japan and North Korea held secret behind the scenes talks throughout the 1990s, but any mention of the, the Japanese abductees would cause the DPRK side to leave in anger. And the Pyongyang Declaration itself does not explicitly contain the words abductee or abduction, instead using the more generic term outstanding problems. Japan needed to get around this apprehension by being pragmatic with its choice of language, which ultimately contributed to the wording of the Pyongyang Declaration. While such a strategy may have been necessary to get Pyongyang to the negotiating table in the first place, this sets an unstable foundation moving forward. As a result, I think it's difficult for the phrase mutual trust to be taken seriously when there was so little trust between both sides to begin with. And this became immediately clear during the next round of talks, which occurred on October, in October 2002, as outlined in the Pyongyang Declaration. 
But the Japanese side stated that the information North Korea provided on the abductees was limited right from the start and inconsistent and dubious on many points. Tokyo claimed that the remains of one abductee Pyongyang provided to them were that of someone else, while the DPRK side continued to stonewall inquiries about further information on any Japanese living or dead within its borders. Five living abductees who uh, returned to Japan chose not to return to North Korea, even though it was supposed to be a temporary stay. And this accused, uh, Pyongyang accused Japan of not honoring its side of the Pyongyang Declaration. But at the same time, uh, this is when it was uh, revealed that North Korea was uh, having a secret nuclear weapons program at the time, which derailed talks even further. So the main themes of the second point deal with Japan expressing deep remorse and heartfelt apology for its colonial past and the subject of economic cooperation. Now, this section is notable because it features in no uncertain terms an explicit apology directed at North Korea for wrongdoings committed during the colonial era. It is arguably the least vague part of the Pyongyang Declaration, and it should have been the final word on the subject of the past. And because Koizumi explicitly apologized, North Korea dropped its insistence on a legally binding apology from either the Japanese emperor or the prime minister, which indicated the finality of this statement. But that perhaps was a double-edged sword because North Korea still consistently seeks an apology from Japan, even though the summit was supposed to be the last word on the subject. And since Pyongyang dropped the demand for a legally binding apology, the Japanese side assumed that this was all that would be necessary. Yet, as we've seen throughout the last 20 years, Pyongyang does not consider colonial issues to be resolved. And this ties to the second issue, which is what amount should Japan pay North Korea? What North Korea essentially wanted was the equivalent of the Treaty on Basic Relations Japan had brokered with South Korea in 1965. Some estimates at the time placed the amount Pyongyang was seeking at around 11 billion US dollars, but the total sum was never decided. And should talks ever resume between both sides one day, it is likely that this amount would only be even bigger than what was uh, considered before. But there's also controversy on whether they should be considered economic assistance or wartime reparations, which ties into Japan's apology and if North Korea can accept an apology from Japan. The Pyongyang Declaration was supposed to definitively address these issues, but ultimately it did not. For the time being, the international sanctions regime led by the United States and the UN makes Japan sending North Korea any kind of economic assistance at all incredibly unlikely. So moving on to the third and fourth points of the Pyongyang Declaration. There's actually very little to distinguish point three and four together, so I put them to one section. And the main theme of point three is compliance with international law and the promise that regrettable incidents would not happen to Japanese nationals again. And this is very similar to the fourth point, which is based on cooperation, again, based on mutual trust to ensure regional peace and stability. Now, the language utilized here essentially consists of generic promises that both sides would look towards peaceful coexistence. But from the outset, there was little confidence that North Korea would hold its side of the bargain. While it was unlikely that North Korea would abduct any Japanese nationals again, its reluctance to use the word abduction and opaqueness in working with Japan on the issue calls into question if mutual trust ever existed between both sides. And from a security standpoint, Japan had long expressed concerns about uh, Pyongyang's table dome one missile test. And uh, Kim Jong-il promised that there would be a moratorium on missile testing. And it's often cited this is one victory that Koizumi got out of the summit was a uh, reaffirmation of this moratorium on missile testing. But at the time, ex experts expressed concerns that North Korea was simply using its allies, such as Pakistan and Iran, as surrogates for missile testing. So while the missile testing might not have been taking place in the area of the Korean Peninsula, the same technology was being used and tested uh, with North Korea's allies. And at the same time, Washington was suspicious that Pyongyang was continuing its uranium enrichment program. So in short, the words of the Pyongyang Declaration don't really match the actions of Pyongyang itself at the time. 
So moving on to the second section of the paper, I compare the Pyongyang Declaration to three other agreements, and because of time constraints, I'll just briefly summarize here. So the point of this section is to illustrate the US, Japan, and South Korea have long had problematic negotiations with North Korea that used vague language or were otherwise hindered by other factors that called into question their reliability. So the agreed framework, for example, was the landmark agreement between the Bill Clinton administration and Kim Jong-il's regime in 1994. And this was the closest that both countries came to normalizing relations at the time since the end of the Korean War. Um, as explained in the previous presentation, North Korea promised to freeze its nuclear power plant system in exchange for light water reactors provided by the US. And um, unlike the Pyongyang Declaration, um, I would say that the, the agreed framework it benefited from having a more concrete timeline of what was to be provided, but it similarly came from a place of little goodwill on both sides. Partisanship at home from Republicans limited what the Clinton administration could achieve as congressional approval is necessary or was necessary. And uh, discrepancies discovered by the IAEA and North Korea's uranium enrichment behind the scenes went against the spirit of the agreement, ultimately rendering it null and void by the time the Bush administration came around. Now, another agreement, the South North Joint Declaration in 2000, it was also a similar landmark agreement, but this time between both Koreas. But unlike the agreed framework, it lacked a concrete timeline. And like the Pyongyang Declaration, it used similarly vague language about peace and stability. There were no mention of nuclear issues, and its harshest critics accused it of essentially rewarding North Korea for its unchanged bad behavior, which were also similar criticisms levied against the agreed framework and the Pyongyang Declaration. Now, by the time we arrive in 2018 with the Singapore Declaration signed by President Trump and Kim Jong un, I argue that these problems of language have not changed and have arguably only gotten worse. Promises of peace on the Korean Peninsula were contradicted by North Korea's own nuclear developments behind the scenes, and Trump's suspension of joint exercises achieved very little in the way of tangible gains for Washington. So I conclude with why Japan North Korea relations have remained so poor over the last 20 years. Firstly, there's the abduction issue. While Japan is sometimes criticized for being stubborn on the abductions, North Korea has acted in bad faith by being opaque and using the issue as leverage. In 2014, the Stockholm summit was the closest progress was made since the 2002 Pyongyang summit, with North Korea going as far to reopen investigations into Japanese living in the DPRK in exchange for sanctions relief from Tokyo. And at this time, Japan was very flexible with North Korea. It was very patient, it promised sanctions relief, and it did uh, give sanctions relief. But Pyongyang was very slow to update Japan on progress, and negotiations eventually fell through completely following the DPRK's nuclear test in 2016. And this ties to the second point of why relations are so poor, which is North Korea's own nuclear ambitions. The circumstances are much more precarious now compared to 20 years ago, since North Korea has tested multiple nuclear weapons. And this alone precludes any promises North Korea has agreed to in the Pyongyang Declaration and other documents. Japan has had no choice but to impose further sanctions on Pyongyang and has now chosen to strengthen its alliance with the United States for security reasons. And under these circumstances, diplomacy between Japan and North Korea is all but impossible. And then we arrive at the third reason, which I argue is that Japan is arguably a tertiary player when it comes to regional negotiations with North Korea. The Green Framework and the South North Declaration both came before the Pyongyang Declaration and were done independently without any input from Japan. Japan attempted to pragmatically express its stance on the abduction issues through Trump with the US during the Singapore and Hanoi summits, but this too did not achieve the results it wanted either. With this backdrop, I think Japan holds very little leverage and it's essentially constrained by whatever progress the US and South Korea make with Japan, uh, with North Korea. So to conclude, I say the Pyongyang Declaration was ultimately a failure because it was a flawed agreement to begin with. It repeated similar mistakes of previous agreements while mutual trust was already non-existent between both sides. Japan and North Korea remain at odds with one another due to irreconcilable differences, which has led to a stalemate that looks increasingly unlikely to change anytime soon. And uh, that's it. Thank you for listening. Two presentations down. And last but not least, uh, Arusha Singh has a paper to present for us. Good morning, everyone. My name is Arushi Singh. I'm currently a research scholar at Jawaharlal Nehru University. 
uh, and I would like to uh, thank the presenters of the conference for this great opportunity to present my research. Uh, I usually work on North Africa and West Asia. And of course, I'm also really interested in emerging technologies. That's why uh, I wanted to focus on North Korea because North Korea has been really focusing on uh, technologies in the region, uh, particularly missile technology. So this is how I, uh, this is why I thought about doing this um, paper. So the topic of my paper is perceptions and misperceptions in North Korea and West Asia and North Africa relations. So West Asia is another term that India uses for Middle East. So basically, if we look at uh, it geographically from India, West Asia, Middle East is not in Middle East, it's West Asia. So this is a term I will be using uh, going forward. Uh, so this is the format of my presentation. I will talk about it as I go. So why the theme? Why I was really focused on working on it? So aside for, uh, from the reasons uh, that I mentioned, a lot of things also come up when we talk about North Korea in regards to the region, taking into context the historical part of the relationship, how North Korea was involved in uh, 1973 uh, during the war, particularly against Israel. And there has been this... Um, animosity between North Korea and Israel and how uh, North Korea is not recognized by Saudi Arabia. You know, uh, this U.S. ally a dynamic, it also extends to the Middle East, to West Asia. And this becomes extremely interesting. So what is the basis of this relationship? Is this only an anti-American, anti-hegemonic kind of a relationship? Or does this relationship go uh, does this relationship goes beyond that dynamic, that very baseline foundation? Or is it just a transactional relationship because North Korea is selling a lot of weapons? You know, Soviet Union uh, era weapons at very bargain bin prices, very low prices. And it's not concerned really about great power, unwillingness to sell weapons or, you know, UN sanctions. That is not something that it is really looking at or it has really no, or it has limited political influence in using weapons as a tool of statecraft. So these are some things uh, that come up a lot. And of course, uh, when any country is really utilizing and uh, sending weapons without consideration of regional stability, it can lead to regional volatility. So uh, a lot of experts have been of the opinion that North Korea has really been facilitating regional instability. And uh, when we look at uh, when we look at it from the perspective of geopolitics, stability becomes very important. Balance of power is very important, particularly in the region of West Asia, where we have hydrocarbons. And any change in that kind of dynamic really impacts the world, like we have seen uh, uh, due to the war in Ukraine and the prices that have been uh, seen rising and what the impact has been. Of course, uh, there is a special relationship, I would say, with Syria that North Korea has. Basically, the relationship is quite, uh, it has like quite a long history. It goes it goes back to 1960s. And even after um, the Assad regime really committed atrocities, it was really supported by the DPRK. Uh, not only through uh, defense relations or uh, giving defense weapons by uh, DPRK, but through diplomatic uh, declarations also the regime in North Korea supported the Assad regime. Even uh, Iran, um, so basically uh, Iran, uh, which is a Syrian ally, there was this uh, rhetoric that was coming up again and again that they were, uh, Iran and North Korea, they were going to put up this anti-hegemonic front. But of course, one of the most worrying thing uh, was uh, the presence of North Korean soldiers in um, Syria. So that is, of course, uh, very problematic when there are boots on the ground, because that can lead to escalation. So and of course, that also limits the plausible deniability of country. So that can lead to diplomatic incidents. And it's very problematic, because it invites other powers in and it can lead to a void that can be filled by uh, other powers. So that is, uh, I think, extremely problematic, particularly um, uh, Syria, when Syria is also trying to utilize the space, right? So basically, Syria used this opportunity to facilitate uh, dialogue between uh, North Korea and Houthis um, into acquiring weaponry. And at that time, North Korea was also thinking of selling to the UAE. So um, uh, North Korea was becoming very embroiled in the region, and that could have given an enormous leverage. Um, 
and that could have been problematic for negotiations in the pen peninsula itself. Now, uh, moving on to uh, the second slide, uh, survey of literature dominant view. So a lot, uh, so another relationship that is very interesting has been the Yemeni North Korean relationship. So as the civil war has been ranging on, uh, uh, the civil war has provided really a space for a lot of actors to come in. And North Korea has also been one of the actors. So North Korea has sold weapons to both sides. Uh, both sides. So it has not only sold weapons to the UAE, it has also sold weapons to the Houthis. So this is something that is very, uh, this is something that's uh, really uh, opportunistic on the part of North Korea, selling weapons to both sides. Um, and this has increased uh, instability in Yemen, of course, and in the re region itself, because it borders uh, Saudi Arabia. So that could also be a reason to destabilize the borders of a major US ally. So there are multiple dimensions of, I think, um, North Korean commitment as, uh, even though the literature mentions some, but I think there are limitations. Uh, the limitation is looking at it only from a, or purely from an economic perspective. A lot of literature uh, is talking about the fact that um, North Korean reserves, foreign reserves, they are very limited. So basically, they are selling weapons just to, you know, just to shore up any kind of um, foreign reserves. But uh, but I also think there is this very um, insidious kind of uh, or very geopolitical uh, aspirations to some of those uh, some of those decisions, as opposed to the purely economic calculation that we have been uh, told to leave. Another part is, of course, this genuine threat to international security and stability. So just because um, West Asia, just because of its location, geographical location, and the amount of resources, hydrocarbon resources that are going there, any kind of threat to that uh, to stability there could be a stability to global uh, security and prosperity. Uh, another thing um, that comes up is the organizational relationship that the DPRK has um, with countries in the region. So, uh, of course, uh, countries do not, of course, organizations do not have that close of a relationship, but in the, there is some possibility, uh, even uh, some experts have spoken about the possibility of Saudi Arabia uh, becoming or uh, developing relations. But, but right now, it's, uh, I think, not very feasible in the uh, short term, but in the long term, it could be feasible. For instance, as Iran advances or wants to advance its nuclear program, uh, and of course, DPRK is not opposed to fueling both sides or providing both sides with a weapon. It could provide Saudi Arabia with weapons. Of course, Saudi Arabia has vast reserves. It could provide economic support for its technological support. So this is something, of course, it's highly unlikely, but this is one of the factors that um, is very important for consideration. But uh, despite these, as the US focuses on Indo-Pacific towards this pivot to uh, Indo-Pacific, um, a lot of people uh, in the region, they have felt that they have not been heard and uh, there has been this emergence of the uh, Mubarak phenomena because um, a lot of leaders uh, after the Arab thing, they were of the opinion that um, basically um, Hosni Mubarak was hung out to dry and this could happen to any of them. So they have to diversify their relationship and DPRK also comes up as one of the options to diversify and as such, there could be some political, and of course there are political similarities as well. The uh, DPRK is also a very authoritarian regime and uh, countries in the region, they also prefer authoritarian leaders because they they can give that long-term assurance that the uh, region desperately lacks uh, from its Western allies. So this is something to consider and something that could take shape very uh, prominently in the future. Uh, research gap. So as so, there were quite a few research gap. Even research gap. So even though a lot of uh, articles uh, they spoke about the relationship between Iran and North Korea, or some of them spoke about the relationship between um, uh, between North Korea or uh, Syria. But there were very limited articles that were speaking about or Egypt, uh, North Korea, or Egypt. But there were very few articles that was taking an all encompassing viewpoint of uh, what is North Korea doing in the region overall. And there were very limited articles that also focused on the geopolitical aspect I spoke about. All, most of them were speaking about the lack of foreign reserves and how the region was just one source uh, of those foreign reserves for North Korea. Uh, so these are the objectives of my research. I will talk about them as I go.
So the first objective was seeing what are the contemporary aspects of the relationship. So since the Trump administration, uh, so the Trump administration really put pressure uh, uh, on the countries in, in the region to really uh, cut off ties with uh, North Korea, and a lot of them did. So, but still, North Korean workers were still involved in the FIFA World Cup, and uh, uh, so this was extremely uh, difficult uh, from a public diplomacy point of view for Qatar, of course, because uh, uh, the because even though the Kapala system, they have scrapped it, but still a lot, like 90% I've seen, I've read that 90% of the salary of the workers who are working currently there, it is sent directly to North Korea, it is not given to the workers and the workers are working longer hours and in atrocious conditions. So even though uh, these are the, these are some of the things that the workers have to suffer, North Korean workers who are working on the stadiums and other construction sites for the World Cup. Even though, even though it, this was a very uh, public event, Qatar still used those vocals. So uh, this just uh, shows a lack of consideration and I think and what they can get away with. So this can uh, be something that we should uh, keep into mind going ahead. So even though in this very uh, public event, North Korean uh, vocals were used. So Qatar is not very opposed to uh, working with North Korea in the open. Maybe this can be one of the signs. Another thing that comes up is North Korea and Israel. So there has been this intense animosity between uh, those two countries. Uh, they have spoken about, of course, North Korea's relationship with, the, with Iran has been very worrying. Um, Iran has bought a number of missiles from North Korea that could re uh, reach Israel. And the rhetoric has also been not very kind from both sides. So. Uh, as such, right now, the relationship is extremely frosty. Even though in the 1990s, there was this um, attempt to reach some kind of uh, diplomatic impasse. So uh, there were very intense uh, negotiations. But of course, uh, Israeli negotiators at the time, they felt that um, that uh, even if a, a deal was reached, there could be uh, problems. Like they use the word cheat, like the relationship um, that there would be a very limited, very slim possibility that a relationship or uh, any kind of deal could be reached where Israel would not be cheated. So th this chances were very slim, but even though they still negotiated, so, so that is something to consider. So at least there is a history, there is a precedent of negotiation. So that is something to consider for the future. Another thing that comes up is uh, DPRK is undercutting Saudi security interests in the region. So by supplying Houthis, so, and even by negotiating through Syria, of course, uh, which is a major, a major ally for Iran and Iran and Saudi, they have, uh, they have this extreme animosity, of course, the Shia Sunni divide is there and other interests are also there. And of course, they are both selling hydrocarbons. So the economic aspect also comes in, but still by selling it to the Houthis, uh, DPRK really undercut uh, uh, Saudi's uh, interest in the region. And of course, it was also an embarrassment to the Saudi because uh, the country, the bordering, uh, there is a border and border issues are particularly sensitive um, in the region. Uh, of course, uh, there is this uh, relationship that uh, a lot of articles also mentioned how our experts were also uh, interested, how uh, North Korea was focusing on Iran allied proxy militia. So one of them is, of course, Hamas. So even, uh, so there is the support that North Korea provides to Hamas. So this is something uh, that is uh, fueling this animosity between Israel and North Korea as well. Another thing that comes up, even though this is, okay, okay I will just finish up. Uh, so there is also this cultural uh, dimension for the relationship. Um, uh, North Korea has invested in models for museums in Iran. It has invested in a monument in the Suez um, in Egypt. And of course, uh, for hard currency, it has also opened restaurants like North Korean food restaurants in Dubai. But this is something that the cultural aspect is there as well. There are multiple driving factors. There is long-term missile development that I spoke about. Uh, and this is quite a uh, comprehensive development. There is also uh, this development of trilateral between Iran, Venezuela, and North Korea. And um, so basically the embassies, uh, they have been used as a hub to, so, uh, to sell weapons. And the largest embassy in the region is in Cairo. And that embassy has been used to sell weapons in Africa, beyond the region, uh, and even fueling uh, instability in Africa. So that is something uh, that's really interesting.
another uh, thing is of course the historical part even in algeria north africa north korean workers have been used and uh, north korea has given weapons to hezbollah like i spoke about the proxy uh, support and uh, an egyptian uh, tycoon so uh, egyptians have been involved in the not in north korea itself they have uh, repaired some monuments there and they have um, really built uh, uh, really built the cell phone network in the country itself of course there is also the uh, uh, geopolitical context uh, north korea is also trying to diversify away from china there is a dependence of course there was a possibility that uh, north korea could build ties with russia but there have been financial woes and now with the invasion that's really uh, difficult um uae has um however withdrawn its support uh, because of pressure from saudi arabia and showing a commitment and blocking iranian access so this is something that has been pretty important and various countries qatar jordan uh, kuwait uh, they have uh, like i spoke about like because of the pressure from the trump administration they have stopped issuing uh, any kind of uh, visas so um, but still north korea has been selling on involved in uh, missile um, transfers to iran syria and even palestine now uh, this uh, the challenges and prospects for relations diplomatically uh, there is some possibility there could be diversification efforts but um, a lot of things that are uh, that are happening for instance our uh, doctors north korean doctors they were caught smuggling gold and medical supplies of out of libya so the this like really impacts perception uh, perceptions in the country this shows that there is this uh, uh, the trust is really broken and this really impacts the relationship across the region because libya itself has been so uh, broken and devastated by war so that that was really problematic for perceptions and of course there is a, a proliferation risk and whenever also that also impacts perceptions and that could uh, come up as a challenge um, in the relationship now conclusion so a lot of relationships they are based on cold war legacy particularly uh, the syrian relationship the special relationship in a way and of course uh, a lot of other relationships they are based on uh, military deals illicit military deals because of us sanctions and um, of course guest worker uh, linkages are there that are used to shore up foreign reserves now uh, just going through relationship i think it can be said that a lot of them are based on that are based on this aspect and are very transactional in nature and there are major inconsistencies consistencies but um, another thing that came up there are some factors that could uh, dilute the relationship so one was uh, uh, was of course that even uh, if um, some of uh, western allies of some countries in the region so a lot of uh, countries they had their uh, accounts frozen because of un sanctions so if their accounts were open that could dilute the relationship you can give them an incentive to basically not cooperate with uh, north korea so this these are some of the things that come up. uh so this is a bibliography and thank you uh, thank you Garusha, for your presentation um so at this point it's my turn to to Thoughts on uh, what you're saying so far. So I, I think I will just uh, address my comments in order. So first of all, uh, to Professor Millar, thank you for your presentation. Um, as far as uh, EU relations with the the DPRK goes, uh, it's, it's kind of it always occurs to me that EU relations with the DPRK are always an afterthought. It's always US DPRK relations, South Korean DPRK relations with China. So it, uh, this is a part of the diplomacy that North Korea engages in. It's uh, really not engaged with, not talked about that much in the literature. So uh, it's interesting to hear. Um, and you, you mentioned that how the EU has had a lot of success as, as an organization, as a, held up as a model for integration. And one part of that integration would be kind of this unified foreign policy where, you know, they're all still individual countries, but they're expected to kind of toe a specific line. Um, the DPRK did have relations with Europe uh, during the Cold War, although primarily with the Eastern Bloc countries. And it's interesting because there's scholarship that talks about their relations with the Eastern Bloc countries and lots of great archival research that gets into the ins and outs of dealing with, with North Korea as a diplomat from Eastern Europe. And uh, 
Uh, we even had a paper in North Korean Review a few years ago about uh, the relations between Sweden and uh, and a lot of those papers they kind of conclude with, and then the EU happened, and we all had to deal with the EU corners. We had to follow their norms, we had to you know, guidelines for foreign policy. So a lot of the interaction that had been going on just kind of hit a hit a wall. So. Um, I often look at the EU as almost a hurdle to diplomacy with the DPRK. Because it is, I, I guess, arguably, uh, probably a little bit more of a ethically driven foreign policy than, than perhaps the US foreign policy towards the DPRK, which is a lot more security focused. Um, so I, I just have a few questions regarding the paper one. Uh, you mentioned country specific paper, but as, as non European, I really don't know that much about them. And I, I'm just curious what their role is. Like, are, are they just to outline that this is how we engage with them or why we should engage with them? Or is it much more, or is it more in terms of limiting how we should engage with them? Uh, is it a policy paper? Or is it like we should engage with them? Because we need to I would just like to know a little bit more of like what the the intention or purpose of that type of a document is. Um, also, uh, you mentioned a drop in trade after the country specific paper expired, but when I was looking at your timeline, all I could see was missile test, nuclear test, sanction, 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 sanction. So I, I don't know how much of a correlation there is between the end of this country specific paper. I, I feel most people would say, well, that's just because the sanctions tech so much you couldn't, that you couldn't trade. So I'm, I'm just curious if if the country specific paper had a role or maybe the sanctions had a role in you know, allowing that to expire without having any more ready ready to go. Um, uh, if we look at other uh, communist countries or dictatorships that deal with, with regional groupings, China, when they deal with ASEAN, they like to pick them off one by one. And I think China prefers to deal with a lot of EU countries that way as well. I'm, I'm curious, again, like I said, I feel like the EU was a wall for the DPRK in a lot of ways. So uh, I'm, is, is there any way for individual EU countries to still have some sort of interaction with the DPRK? Or, uh, all right, and then Oliver, uh, the Pyongyang Declaration, I, you know, that was kind of a momentous occasion where Japan finally, Jeff Dictator visits uh, Pyongyang and apologizes for the in the past. Uh, you know, when I first came to Korea, it seemed like there were all these momentous things happened. I was here during the, the Kim Daytown summit, and I remember the energy around, and then obviously it wasn't as much energy here, but. It, it just seemed like there was always something that sounded very historic happening when I came to Korea. Um, and especially for North Korea as well, because Japan has always been kind of a boogeyman in the DPRK. And the abductee issue has always been really large for Japan. So, uh, and the, obviously the idea of ecology is something that in Northeast Asia at large is often something that Japan is accounted for. So there's a lot of moving parts there that I, that I think are interesting. And I, I also think your assessment of it is, is quite accurate, where this broad joint statement was mostly not lived up to on, and uh, especially on the part of the DPRK. Uh, but joint statements from leadership summits are almost always of, of that nature. They very seldom have any finite policy agenda that is really mentioned. It's, it's, it's more of an aspirational document, I think, and then the, the if any real policy is meant to come from that, it, it comes from professional diplomats and bureaucrats uh, putting together initiatives and the actual cooperation. I'm, I'm at the end of the day, what I I feel like happens is you have a a very broad statement, but with the DPRK, because as you mentioned the issue of trust, everyone falls back to pragmatism and then momentum is lost from whatever the energy the leaders had in their meeting and 
very little that's accomplished, and that happens as you show in the comparison again and again. Um, but the idea of trust with North Korea, I don't know if that's a hurdle that you overcome. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. But is the failure of the agreement proof that these types of agreements hold no value, or is it simply that they can be archaic and trusted? It's one question I have. And if it's that they can't be trusted, then the value of the comparison becomes a, a little bit easy or too easy, right? So, um, and then the comparison, all the ones that you brought up were great, and I think are, are good. Uh, documents to show between the US and DPRK, ROD, DPRK, but um, they're all failures. And I'm just curious if you're going to have a joint statement and it doesn't, wouldn't have to be with the DPRK, has there ever been a joint statement between two leaders who led to like some concrete policy initiative? Like what is a successful joint statement versus these failure failed ones? And I feel like if you threw in one comparison that was a successful one, then, then we would be able to get a little bit because just looking at failure after failure, it just kind of it's kind of like you know, the heat goes off, right? I mean, you you said that Japan is a tertiary player. I mean, I'm just curious of like within the region, I would say that Japan is probably the second biggest. Right? I mean, obviously the U.S. security wise is a big one, but uh, I think bilaterally, uh, North Korea would be just more what Japan has to offer. So I'm I'm curious. Uh, why you, how you define tertiary? And then last but not least for Arushi, uh, above all, uh, what I see in your presentation is you have a lot of ambition uh, to try and address DPRK relations with such a large region of the world, I, I think uh, is, is admirable, but um, I, I think perhaps a, a little bit more focus might might uh, help improve what you're working on. But I, I do find I am interested in the idea of North Korea and, and Africa Middle Eastern relations because, um, again, during the Cold War, uh, a lot of that that part of the world was this hotbed of competition between South Korea and North Korea, trying to compete for influence, wanting recognition from all these countries. And uh, that kind of died off after the Cold War. Uh, it seems like North Korea might be more interested in, in that region now than, than South Korea in a lot of respects. Um, and especially after the Cold War, North Korea kind of became basically a loner. They didn't have a lot of friends left on the playground. So they started looking in places where other people were. So, but again, it receives very little attention because everyone is so focused on U.S., North Korea, ROD, North Korea. So again, I, I, really, I, I find this interesting. Um, and, you know, but nowadays within the region, they're more interested in things like building monuments for other dictators or military cooperation or other illicit activities, like you said, proliferation activity. So um, I just had a couple questions. Uh, because it's very broad and you have so many countries, I feel like if you focus on like, this could be broken into several papers and you pick one country and then focus on like one aspect of their cooperation would be interesting. So what do you think is the most important or interesting aspect of DPRK, WA, and the uh, relations? And then the other question is, you mentioned that they only have two, two uh, embassies Cairo and Algiers, and what is special about their relations with the governments involved or that uh, makes, that motivates them, I guess, to invest with, because North Korea has limited resources, so that's why they don't have embassies everywhere. What is it about Cairo and Algiers that is special that they spend their limited funds on keeping those embassies open and being active? Uh, yes, thank you, sir. Uh, that was like really interesting. So uh, yes, in the future, I'll be focusing on 
one aspect i understand the region is quite vast uh, but i really wanted to focus on like an overarching point of view like what were the commonalities was there uh, so as to say some north korean grand strategy i think that would be something really uh, interesting to come up with what is north korean grand strategy in the wana region um i just wanted to ask can you just repeat your first question i just heard syria i couldn't uh, understand uh, the question okay we we only have a limited amount of time so very very quickly what do you think is the most important or interesting aspect of dprk on the relation uh uh yes sir okay so i think the most interesting is of course uh, the technological part how this country that is like in some aspects very deprived but they are really focused on missile development and what could uh, this uh, relationship this cooperation mean for the future so i think that is of course uh, very important and has global implications so i think the technological part is very important and one of the most interesting aspects because it veers into other aspects as well you have to have software you have to have hardware then you have to have the logistical part of transport uh, addition uh, so this is pretty important and then you can sell it to other countries right the mili- um, military industrial complex so you can have a lot of development you say, can sell it to other countries across the world that you want it so i think this is the part that's very important and very interesting as well the other part uh, was about the embassies so uh, the embassy part is in these two countries first of all their location is very important so you have the mediterranean then you have africa so you can like do you can sell to a lot of countries you can sell uh, to countries in the, that part of the world and then you can sell in africa and of course uh, these countries you can ship a lot of uh, there has been a shipment that has been found of weapons from north korea uh, that was inbound for egypt so you can uh, have these weapons go there and then you can have these embassies be a logistical hub for uh, with the short amount of time we have uh, so if a trust with north korea is possible uh, well in a perfect world i would like to believe that it is possible to have trust with any country to have a good relationship with any country but it's just that it's very hard to have that kind of sense with north korea just given its repeated violations of agreements over the years so um i i'm not sure we have to like get to some uh, situation where uh and be until north korea changes its behavior i think it's just going to be very hard to have any diplomatic games with them and i think it's very cyclical and then just uh, very quickly in regards to japan's tertiary status i think that's because North Korea values first relations with the US as number one important and the second South Korea and then if they could do great things with Japan then they'll do the relations with Japan but they're more uh, focused on the US and South Korea in my opinion. Okay so uh, uh thank you for your comments. Um so um firstly um I agree with what you said before that um pretty much once the cold war ended and we created this what they call common foreign policy that, that has acted as a wall. Um, my opinion there's nothing common about the foreign policy in the EU 27 different countries have different foreign policies and it's very hard to create cohesion um with regards to country specific papers um these days they're really not used very much um, most is just strategic partnerships or comprehensive partnerships or FTAs and like that um what a country specific paper would be i would go so far as to say it's like a white paper of course paper for a specific country suggestions of framework. Um, second question was regarding the sanctions. Of course, yes, the sanctions have played a huge role in the drop off in trade. So what I was going to say very well was that the EU had this option. They could have taken a different direction and not applied sanctions and not followed what the US wanted. And they could have followed their own unilateral approach which could have maintained trade with fewer sanctions. And therefore the last question um individual EU relations with the states um in terms of trade nope just not possible in any way because um trade policy is an EU competence so that's not allowed. In terms of foreign relations there's only several countries that have embassies in relation with DPRK. they can have official relations but they can't make specific um, policies with the DPRK on their own it's all controlled through the EU. all right uh i guess we'll wrap up the session here